why did Moses leave Egypt? He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't have to worry about anything. Everything was all good. But the word of God records the fact that he said he would rather not stay. Why? Because of sin for a season. This is was his this was his decision. You know, sometimes we think God doesn't understand our concept and our need for fun and activities. And we think we all good and we need all of these things that God just doesn't understand and we have the misconception that we can have our fun and go back to serving God any time we want to. But that's not always true. There comes a payday when we have to make that payment to the one we have been serving. The devil will tell us, you know, in the beginning, there's no charge. You don't have to worry about it. Just go on and do your thing. But there comes a time when he's going to come and ask you for that payoff. Well, you're going to tell him, well, no, nah, you told me there was no charge. And he's going to say, I lied because that's what I do. Let's set the stage for this video. Why did Moses leave in his, during his time? Moses was born during a crisis for the throne. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he was a slave. He was not of royal blood, so probably he would never have made it to the throne. Now, mind you, he was raised in the courts of Egypt. He understood all of the things that had gone on before. He knew about the, um, how can I say, the uh, messing with history that the pharaohs were prone to do. He understood all this, how the pharaohs would never record a defeat. They would make a defeat look like a victory, as we shall see here later. And if you look at verse 12 in Exodus 2, and it says, He looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. If Moses was a true heir, there is no way he would have had to run away. But Moses was the descendants of the slaves that the Egyptians held in bondage. He was a love he was loved by Pharaoh's daughter. She loved him, that's what she said when she drew him out the water. So we see a young man who had a great opportunity, but I'm sure he would not have come out good for him. He was the son of the slaves that the Egyptians ruled. So as we shall see from this video, do not throw away your faith in your word. Do not, because of the so-called chronologies that come out of Egypt, that disprove that the Israelites were even in Egypt. And they challenge our faith in the Word of God based on their uh, so-called validity of documents that you will see are not real. The stuff they use, the chronologies they use, many of them were created by people trying to prove their legitimacy to the throne when in actuality they had no royal blood. So it's the same thing with Moses. Moses chooses. Moses chooses. Right. He leaves. He now, despite the wealth of materials from Egypt, we need to recognize that the pharaohs were also masters of misinformation. They were good at it. And this is what this video will show you. This, this, this particular article I'm using is found on creation.com. And you can see the URL. I picked this one because it doesn't support either Pharaoh for being on the throne at the time of Moses. This is just to give you a little background on why determining who that is is absolutely so hard. This is a quote from this gentleman. He said, nor does Egyptian civilization falsify biblical history as the skeptics would like us to think. There are many people out there who want us not to believe this. The Egyptian history is long, but the information that's there is, like the gentleman said before, is all based on who was recording the history. It was based on who was recording the history. I want you to understand that. That's what's so important about this. This information does not falsify the Bible at all. The skeptics are trying to get us to feel that. 
this is a wonderful thing, what Moses did and what he became. This scripture is found in what's called the roll call of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Moses did not leave voluntarily. Moses left. He thought he was doing a good thing. He knew who he was. And so he was not trying to be uh, connected to the Egyptians. He was keeping himself in a position where at any time he could be the solution to the problem of his brethren. When he killed that Egyptian and hid him in the sand, he hid him because he knew what would happen to him as a slave killing one of his masters. Think about that. He killed one of the overseers who was oppressing his brethren that he came up on. He killed this man and hid him in the sand. He had to. He was hoping it wouldn't be found out. Because he's probably thinking that I can help my brother and we can rise up as a big host. Because he truly was trained in the military capabilities of the armies of Egypt. He he was a general. He was leading the armies of Pharaoh into battle and probably having great victories. But Moses thought he was going to use force of arms to help set his people free. But God had another plan. When you read this in the um, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, the verse before 25 says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. When he left, he didn't have a clue. This, this is written after the fact. But it's like us. Moses grew in his faith. Moses began to understand who he was. He left to keep from getting killed by Pharaoh for killing that overseer. But as he grew in God, as he began to understand the concept of his life, the concept of what God does for us, he understood the concept of that season. That anything Pharaoh offered was truly temporary truly temporary. Now, I ask you the question, what did Moses leave behind? What kind of nation was Egypt at this time? What kind of things did they have? By the time Moses was there, the great pyramids were already there, long since built. So what did he leave behind? Why was he willing to leave with no thought of going back? We have to remember that Moses did not leave a barbaric country, a country with little education or innovation. The Egyptians were very innovative. The Greeks like to brag about their knowledge of mathematics, but they got it from the Egyptians. And Egypt was well versed in how to create strong metal alloys. And as you can see here, there's this list, they had all kinds of things. Not only did they have writing, the pyramids, and but what I found interesting, they had wigs, cosmetic, medical, police, clock, toothpaste, you know, so they had a whole lot of things going on for them. So it was not a barbaric, uh, uneducated environment where he was. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter in a very wealthy and powerful nation of its day. So they also had the ability of brewing beer, <laughs> engineering, construction, agriculture, architecture, medicine, astronomy, art and literature. You know, I added all this so you can see. And they had like the handheld mirror. Uh, and they were very hygienic. They very much understood who they were and what they were about. And they were very clean. Now... This I found interesting. Egyptians are noted in many aspects of their culture as very conservative society and this adherence to a certain way of accomplishing a task. Now basically what this, this little statement says is they built those giant obelisks and they moved them but the documentation doesn't tell how they erected them. They had strict adherence to standard procedure and there is no recorded information that would tell you how the Great Pyramids on the Gaza plain were built. 
the uh, irrigation techniques were so effective they were embraced by the Greeks and the Romans and also the canals that the canal systems that many of the uh, Greeks brought into Egypt the Egyptians just improved upon them and turned them into very ornate areas in the kingdom now this part I thought was very interesting um, in creating these great mon monuments and these great pyramids and some of the other things that they built there the uh, Ramesses himself decided to reach back to the the old kingdom and they came up with the Car Carbell arch and this is what made many of the great structures in Egypt possible as you can see here the, the little drawing is how it's laid out so that it handles the stress of the great weight in an effective manner now astronomy was also important the Egyptians looked at astronomy on two levels the spiritual and the practical and basically it was very important to them so the stars told the story of the gods accomplishments and trials but also indicated the passage of time and the season mathematics was used for like record-keeping schematics drawings you know site location building projects so they were very advanced in what they did and they were very innovative now, this I thought was really good. Ebers uh, Papyrus is actually a 110-page uh, document for treating everything. I, I was just amazed at how it treats various kinds of ailments, traumas, cancer, heart disease, depression, dermatology, gastrointestinal distress, and many others. So they were not lacking in medical skill and know-how, and they also had dental uh, medical knowledge. And they also understood art and literature, as we can tell from the pyramids that are still there. And when you look at the walls of the pyramids, the portions that the ink is still good, the ink is vibrant and bright. They were very artistic and very innovative. This is a little study on that word season. This is kind of continuing on. As we know, Moses left for fear of his life. He had to leave. He had no choice. And he ended up out in the desert. You know, we know the story of Jethro and all of these things that transpired in his life. How he got a wife and he had children of his own. But I want to look at this concept of this word. And so Matthew thirteen twenty one is is another word translated temporary. It's called wild. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended because he has no root in himself that it doesn't last and this is what Moses did for us Moses not only lasted but he thrived he, he spent those 40 years watching sheep and he thrived he gave us the first five books of the Bible he provided the many of the laws we live by today he made a lasting impression in the Bible and outside because many of the laws we have today come from the laws found in the Word of God and then 2 Corinthians 4 18 says while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal temporary that's what Moses understood as he grew in his faith as he watched his sheep he began to understand that things of Egypt were not permanent because as I said earlier Moses had a plan to save his brother by force of arms that's why he had no problem killing that guy and the kids that the kids Lord the men who he helped had nerve to come and rail on him talking about oh you gonna kill us too they understood you know because he killed the overseer you know that they, they weren't looking for nothing great they was just giving him a hard time because he living in the palace and yet he wanted them but the things which are not seen are eternal. And this is what Moses began to learn those 40 years in the desert keeping those sheep. It would be great if we could find a pharaoh that corresponds clearly on one of their king lists or one of their temples that will let us know who was there during the time of Moses. But as we will discover shortly, that's not true it's not something you can easily do um, how can I say this the the discoveries and all of the uh, wonderful presentations you find from from researchers and scholars who are Christian who try to pick this Pharaoh that Pharaoh 
from what I have learned from studying this this particular document and just a little bit I've learned the background on how these records were kept as you will discover here shortly they're not very accurate many of them were made way after the fact they were put in the temples long after the various people had died and there were large omissions the Egyptians were not real good on recording a timeline that talked about people who had conquered them who ruled their nation so I just want to reiterate again do not throw away the word of God because quote unquote the skeptics say the chronologies that come out of Egypt do not support the Bible that there were no Hebrews in Egypt that there was no time when they were decimated or anything bad they did not record that and as you will see from upcoming slides this is exactly what happened so I say again do not do not put your faith on the Bible based on secular scholars research we have great scholars who have discovered great things that confirm the validity of the Bible but you got to remember many of these secular scholars whole goal is to discredit the Bible if it hasn't been found that should not shake your faith and stuff these scholars bring up that seek to destroy your faith or cause skepticism in the Word of God you should just look at it and walk off like I do you know that's the real because the stuff they bring forward you must remember their whole goal is to discredit the Bible all of the research and all of the wonderful things that have been found by many of the archaeologists who have who have supported the Bible who are God fearing men and women have proved many things in the Bible that skeptics said 30 40 years ago wasn't true so the history of their research of, of these scholars who are skeptics who want to disprove the Bible time and time again have proven to be wrong so if past history carries anything you should be like I guess I say me you know my whole thing is if you're attacking the Bible are you trying to make me lose faith I ain't got nothing to say to you I don't know what to tell you your stuff don't care no weight with me because if you believe that God is real why are you going to throw the king of heaven away based on somebody who don't believe in him? Who wants to do everything to rock your faith? You need to tell them, miss me. When considering the word season, this is what Moses was thinking about, season. And this is a quote from Acts 24-25 where it talks about Paul's interaction with Felix. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. The same transition that Felix had in Moses, but Moses saw beyond the here and now. Moses looked into the future, realizing that there is a judgment to come that there is accountability and when his time came he left maybe not the way he wanted to but the Word of God reflects what was in his heart once he would let he would he uh, left so we have to be mindful and remember that scripture because if you look at why Moses left it wasn't a, a good thing Moses fled for his life because he had killed a man but he realized later on that it was the best decision of his life. I picked this particular um, document to talk about this topic because he does not try to put Moses under any pharaoh in Egypt. He just gives us a background to help us understand why these chronologies are not accurate. That's what I want to emphasize. These chronologies are not accurate and if you look at the last line and he says nor does Egyptian civilization falsify biblical history as the skeptics would like us to think this particular text found in 1st Kings 6 and 1 in the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, 
in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. This scripture right here gives you a, a time frame. You can work the math out backward and find your way to a time in Egyptian history when you should be able to match this with a pharaoh. Well, well, according to the various chronologies, that's almost impossible. So that's what we're going to discuss here a little bit. We're going to kind of cover some of their methodologies and how they work. And to realize that even though you can come up with a number, you cannot match that to a pharaoh on the throne of Egypt. This this particular slide talks about how the pharaohs want to be worshipped as gods and how many people have the wrong understanding. They figure because they were ancient people, they were not as intelligent and more primitive. And that's not true. And why do they believe that? Because of evolution. Because in the Bible, we believe they were more intelligent by being so close to creation. They were highly intelligent. Now... The, it's true that mystery and debate still surround the methods employed for the construction of the Great Pyramids on Gaza. Nobody knows how they were built. And I found this interesting in his article, which is true, uh, that some people believe that aliens did it, extraterrestrials built or gave them the information. And But what's so interesting is, he goes on to say in his article, that people don't want to admit the fact that these people actually had saws with teeth. Because they're trying to figure out how did they shape all those giant blocks some of them weighing tons to fit into those pyramids this is a very important slide here because this this shows you that the uh egypt was not ruled by egyptians it was ruled from 525 bc until the birth of christ it was ruled by the persians the greeks and then finally the romans so those king lists that include this portion of it they actually leave out this part now, see, that ought to tell you something right there. This is a very important slide because it helps us understand why the Egyptian pharaohs needed to rewrite history and to whitewash it, so to speak. And Seti had a real desire or necessity to do this. There was a revolt. Hormhead was a general of the Egyptian army, and it was the unpopular Armenian era period on the Akhenaten to Ai. I wouldn't say, uh, I guess that's how you pronounce him. So he wanted to make it look like this stuff never existed. So he incorporated the original years from that period of time to his own. And then he made one, the vizier, he had the uh, successor, and he changed his name to Ramesses I, who was the founder of the 19th and 20th dynasty. Now, Seti is the one who compiled this king list that's found at Abydos. So that's why it's so important for us to understand that these king lists cannot be trusted. I'm just sorry. I'm not an Egyptologist. I'm not that type of, that's not my discipline. My discipline is in uh, computer science. But this is a reason for us to be more firm in our faith with God because the Lord gives us an actual starting point when we can calculate when the children of Israel actually left Egypt. But you cannot, I'm going to say this again, I said it before, you cannot you cannot attach that exodus to any particular pharaoh. There are many of them out there. I've seen some really good ones that uh, place Moses at different places in Egyptian history. But even those cannot be fully accurate based on the current information they use to try to prove, prove those theories that they have. So, as we mentioned earlier, I like what this gentleman goes on to say, uh, the pharaohs were not, how can I put this, they created these king lists, but they left this stuff out. And these are some, uh, the next couple of slides is show you how they did that. The king list of Abydos found in Temple of Seti the first. This is the 19th dynasty. This is towards the end. It contains a list of 76 kings allegedly in order from the old kingdom to Seti in the new kingdom, the 19th dynasty. It is the only source we have regarding the names of some of the pharaohs that allegedly exist. What makes this this <laughs> which makes it circumspect. Secular scholars, get this now, readily admit that this list is inaccurate and contains many errors. But this is the list they try to use to say to say that the Bible's not good. The Bible's not accurate. 
the Bible chronology is wrong. And this shows you that cannot prove that because the stuff they're using, the scholars already know. But they will not admit that the Bible is right. Now here you can see just what I said. They want to be legitimate. So with the pharaohs that preceded them, and they were not of noble blood, it was a coup. So the kingless was a vain attempt to legitimize his right to the throne by including himself in a long line of Egyptian pharaohs who preceded him. And then the Turan royal canon is basically the same thing because it was commissioned by Ramesses II. And so they just kind of continued to add and trying their best to legitimize their right to the throne it was a mess now this particular slide shows us that Akhenaten was one of those that they left off the Abydos list because he tried to uh, start the uh, worship of a one true God a sun God that he worshiped so and it you know you got Tutankhamun he got left off the list and and other pharaohs that were related to that family so you can see they were seeking to rewrite history to make their reign legitimate so here we go now i found this so so interesting this 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 is going to take a little minute here now there are no kings mentioned for what was called the second intermediary you know, if you go on the website, you can see the the chart and all that, which in which include the time of the Hakros, a foreign ruler <laughs> for four dynasties. They leave that out. The reason for this is because they were invaders, and then the e Egyptians never dignify their enemies by mentioning their name. And then another pe person they want to get rid of is Queen Hatshepsut, who ruled in in the, in the 18th dynasty with great power. She was the queen of Egypt. And uh, why? Because she was regarded as an illegitimate ruler. So if they leave this out, what else do they leave out? This is why they so-called chronology of this gentleman who wrote it up is, is wrong. So don't let this insanity challenge your faith in the Bible. It's, it's we have great scientists who believe in God, who are creationists, and, and who do great work. But you got to understand what they're working with when it comes to the chronology of e Egypt is vastly inaccurate, and it's just not a solid foundation. Ramsey II was still trying to legitimize his right to the throne because he was descended from from folks who had no royal blood basically and so he created this list and on the list it it had like king gods demigods spirits and human beings who ruled egypt from creation <laughs> to the time the document was presumably crafted on the surface this may be a further attempt to perpetuate ramses the second inheritance to the throne by linking him to the commencement of egyptian history itself now he had no problem going around to these temples removing the other pharaoh's name putting his own on their buildings and things they had erected and i like what it says here this displayed a great deal of disregard for his royal ancestors given the very serious import of preserving images and names for the afterlife so in one aspect he was keen to preserve their names on a list as it legitimized his right to rule, but then usurped what they had done to elevate his own status as being superior to them. Ramesses records this great victory over the Hittites in his uh, on display in his temple at Abu Sabil, and he kind of stressed the truth. He writes this stunning victory with all of the stuff he did, but when in actuality it was, it was a retreat and a subsequent peace treaty. But on the temple, on the temple in in uh, Egypt, he doesn't write that. He doesn't tell the truth. So this is a pattern that has gone on in their uh, recording of their history. So, uh, as I this one just goes on to talk about how they never admit defeat and i like what this egyptologist wrote although many of the list name corresponds to monuments other documents there are some discrepancies and not all of the names correspond question the the absolute reliability of the document of the pre ramesses second chronology see they wanted to be part of that they wanted to be part of that 
So, the, and another thing that's so important when I was doing this, I was surprised. The designation of Pharaoh only started to be used as a title for Egyptian kings during the New Kingdom, which was the 18th dynasty started then. The word actually means great house or royal palace. So, the Hecros ruled the second intermediate period of the 13th to 17th dynasty, and they were not using that. So, the great city known as Avros near Tel Abab, but later Ramesses the second nineteen dynasty constructed Par Ramesan on a nearby site and expanded it to become the major occupied site in this area. Thus, when this area was originally built and occupied many years before the Hebrews, see, it was done before they showed up, it was unlikely to have the name Pharaoh Ramesses attached to the city because they were not using that designation. So that's why it's so important to understand the history of all of this. The Holy Trinity of Egypt is Horus, Amun-Ra, and Peth, I guess that's how you say it. However, in the shrine that Ramesses II built, he broke with tradition and he added a fourth statue in the holy place, that of himself, claiming he was also a god in the tradition of the gods of Egypt. And it's interesting because of their their uh, mathematical capabilities and their ability to build stuff so exactly, the light to this day shines through the entrance on the 22nd of February and the 22nd of October and it actually illuminates these statues in the Holy of Holies. So once again Ramses is trying to legitimize his right to the throne. This this little page right here just goes on to explain uh, Tutmosis III created a list too that uh, is not really valued as a historical record because of how he put in various kings that don't exist in the second period when they were actually being ruled by invaders. Now this is a couple of the various documents they have found. This one goes back to Ramesses and so it's another inscription contains 58 pharaohs of which only 47 Katushas can be read. The um, range from Dynasty 1 to Ramesses the second Dynasty 19 but are actually out of order. It is known to be very inaccurate and makes numerous omissions. Similar to the Abydos list is not highly regarded. Same thing with this stone that also is listing a lot of the um, pharaohs, but they wonder, is it a copy like of a copy? So you can see a pattern. There's a pattern of inaccuracy and people trying to make themselves look legitimate after the fact. Now, we're back to my favorite text again found in 1 Kings 6 and 1 where it tells us when they started to build the Temple of Solomon. And it says that 480 years after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. 480 years after they came out. This slide gives you the calculations on the date from the Bible when the date Solomon started building the temple that the children of Israel would have left Egypt 1446 or 1445 BC but the scholars want a much later date because they want it to be Ramesses but it just doesn't match Ramesses was on the throne Ramesses the second was on the throne 200 years after the biblical date of the Exodus The gentleman who did this document is going over all these different lists that I have mentioned to show that all of them have a problem. And what he says here in the underlying part, they are regularly inaccurate, disagree with each other, and some were compiled with political agenda in mind. So as you can see, they all had gaps in their text. It's not something that was created and flowing smoothly by the history of the people. They had no problem leaving out the generations of those who ruled them. They left them completely out. So the lists are not reliable. So do not throw away your Bible based on the reliability of these lists. They are inaccurate. When you think about time and what Moses said about a season, 
when the demonics asked to be delivered from the demons that were controlling them, these same demons asked to be uh, sent into a herd of swine. They wanted to have a little chat with the master, and they were concerned about the time. It's interesting, they knew who he was. And Matthew eight twenty nine says, And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, the Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time, before the judgment, judgment before the time of absolute punishment these things they understood and so moses also understood the concept of time and that there is a judgment to come and he understood that clearly so we see that when he was there in the palace with the pharaoh and doing all these things he understood because he was aware of their role and how they wrote history and rewrote history to make themselves look good so the season he was waiting on didn't come the way he thought it was and i think that's the way we are we have to be ready for our season when god moves us in a way he put himself in a position to have to flee by killing the egyptian but he was glad to be gone. He never regretted it, even though that was how he left. So we, too, have to have a true understanding of our season. This is what's happening over there now. You got secular and religious revisions of biblical history. There is an ongoing issue with biblical history. The people are trying to... Uh, rewrite history just as the pharaohs did to make it come out the way they want to do it they believe in evolution and they want to invalidate the bible history based on that so do not let these these things you hear coming out of egypt try to shake up your belief in the bible don't do that because you're throwing away truth for an error for people who actually manipulated the records uh, in their own time to legitimize their claim to the throne. This is a sad thing we see in um, archaeology today. As it says here at the very top, it says, Let's recall the importance of the name of pharaohs. Most had a minimum of five. And to use the name of a pharaoh was to give him life in this world and the next. In short, the name on the the name or cartouche had a form of power and significance attached to it, particularly the latter, as it was also a representative symbol or an image of the pharaoh as it spoke his name. So they were very serious about this, not including, not writing about, not doing these things was, was so important to them. They would not write the names of those they dis disrespected or despised. So here in the next paragraph, it mentions that culturally the Egyptians truly despised and disrespected their enemies and anyone who stood against them. This can be seen from their dealings and battles with foreign kings recorded in the various temples around Egypt. In many writings that remain, particularly in the later dynasties, contemporaneous with Moses, you will rarely see the name of a foreign king mentioned. To do so would be to give him credit or status. So were people bragging about there is no recorded history of the Hebrews, why would they be? This is a, a statement that kind of gives you an idea on when the term Pharaoh was actually used. The word Pharaoh was not used in the Old Kingdom. It was used in the later dynasties to designate the uh, the king. So Tutmosis III, when he uh, destroyed the enemies in the, in the, in a battle at Megiddo, he didn't even give the king's name. They just were referred to as princes or the prince of Megiddo. He never listed their names anywhere. Continuing with the concept of not recording the names of your enemies, you see as the gentleman is continuing on with his quote, uh, uh, Hamantep the second, he didn't list the names. He just called them seven chieftains. And this gentleman goes on to say, Therefore, Moses' practice of omitting Pharaoh's throne name next to the dynasty title Pharaoh followed the standard practice of the day in ancient Egypt. So it was not something that he would do. And because it just wasn't done. Hebrew slaves in Egypt. They were there. The word of God says they were there. 
But you have to remember, I'm going to repeat again, the records of Egyptians, pharaohs, they're not going to mention that these slaves were there because of what happened when they left. The God of heaven decimated their country. They're not going to record that. This is a little discussion on history, the season concept. When Joseph was in Egypt, he lived to be 110 years old. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick, and all manner of service in the field, and all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor they worked hard they were slaves to the uttermost but even though joseph lived a hundred and ten years and he died there is no chronology showing how long it was before this king who came to power when the children of israel had grown vast think about that joseph lived a hundred and ten years there is no record in the bible anywhere that talks about how many years that it went before the new Pharaoh came to the throne who had disregarded Joseph. So this is something we need to keep in mind when trying to work out which Pharaoh was there during the time of Moses. So we see clearly here it doesn't state. And when you keep reading in Genesis, uh, it goes right into Exodus after this, you will find there is no timeline. But now all of a sudden the Hebrews are in the millions as opposed to the 70 souls that went. So it was a very long time. It wasn't like it was one or two pharaohs after. It was a very long time because they didn't become in such a, uh, how can I say this, populous nation in just a few years. It took time. There's a popular thing going on now in many documentaries and books that there were no e slaves in Egypt from Hebrew descent. Just not there. And they claim that fact because there's no reference to them. But as we've seen before, this was a common practice in Egypt that they did not record their slaves or anything that was uh, a problem to them. And it's just sad because we will base our faith in God on these false claims made based on the Egyptian chronology and the things coming out of Egypt. That is so not true. You know, so it, it, this Egyptologist guy says the lack of any explicit Egyptian mention of an exodus is of no historical import. Given its unfavorable role in Egypt and the near total loss of all relevant records in any case. So that's just the reality of it. It doesn't mean they were not there. The Egyptians would not have recorded them as you have seen. That's why I spend so much time on showing you that they do not document things that are painful or hurt hurtful or anything that shows them what in a way that is not all powerful they want to be god they have to be god so keep in mind that to mention or read out aloud a person's name in in this world was to give them life in the next and this statement just goes on to make it even more clear why they would not do that because these pharaohs considered themselves to be gods that's why they spent all that money all that time they claimed that they were built by those who loved them and the slaves loved their pharaohs so they built these great big monuments but why did they move to the valley of the kings because of grave robbers they had a whole police force to stop people from robbing their tombs so if they were so loved why was they the need to have these protections I don't know if I want to read this. You know, it's it's like an urban myth. Many of us think that, and I've seen little stories in some Bible books where the children of Israel were building the pyramids. I used to think that, but that's not true. The pyramids were already there even during the time of, of Joseph. So it's actually an urban myth. Large-scale pyramid building ceased at the end of the Old Kingdom. Although building smaller ones continued for hundreds of years, Joseph arrived in Egypt some 400 plus years before the exodus of Moses. So you find that they had long since stopped building those giant pyramids that we see there 
in the on the Gaza Strip, but these uh, it's, it, they call it bait and switch in this article. Egyptologists would love to point to evidence of worker settlements and tombs that have been recently discovered on the Gaza Plateau. Beside these great pyramids, there is evidence from the skeletons of the workers that surgery and broken bones were mended. Meaning, it appears these people were looked after. It seems strong evidence that these were willing workers, and there was no Hebrew settlement in Egypt at that time. The pharaohs needed to recruit locals to help build these great pyramids. True, that's true. That's actually there. But what you want to realize is, don't forget, during the time of Joseph, when people lost everything, they signed themselves as bondmen to Pharaoh. So, yeah, they had voluntary labor. And during that time, Joseph's arrival was there. The pyramids were already there. So it was not uncommon for them to use their own people, or people they had captured in war or whatever, to get the pyramids built. So please don't be discouraged by what you hear coming out of Egypt. And I'm going to say this again. You have to remember the Egyptians never recorded anything negative that happened to them. So the Hebrews were actually involved in minimum, what you call men, <laughs> menu labor. That hard backbreaking stuff, you know, bit bricks and all of this other things they had to do. So let's remember that although Joseph and his family had arrived in the land hundreds of years before this time, it also took a while before they grew in number. And the, the, the whole thing took time. They built Pharaoh's store cities, and it took some time before they were treated as slaves. So after the death of this Pharaoh, there rose another, and which took place. During the latter reign, there is no time span of hundreds of years because it would, all took place in the lifetime of Moses. So from the time Joseph came, from the time Joseph arrived, then all of that time, it took a lot of hundreds of years, probably 400, that's what the Bible says. You know, they were there 400 years before they left. So that would be enough time for them to become a great nation. But then when Moses came up, there was no time frame for that to happen again. So because it happened within the lifetime of Moses. Many blogs we have out there, popular ones, say that us creationists want the uh, updating of the chronology list. But there are many secular scholars who feel we need that desperately. They say we need that desperately. And I like what this gentleman says here, uh, Mr. Huber. He's a journal of Egyptian history. And he writes, uh, the currently accepted Egyptian chronology is a somewhat fragile consensus based on persuasive. I want to say that again persuasive arguments by various scholars but it is confirmed by regrettable few hard facts the chronologies of Egypt and the Near East are patched together from desperate sources so as you can see there is no hard facts to support their view so in short archaeology discoveries in Egypt and the dates assigned to the Egyptian chronology have not falsified the Bible dates for creation and the flood Despite the incredible legacy of the Egyptian pharaohs, the interpretation of their relics and records are not an accurate record of history. Self-interest and agendas were <laughs> the rule of the day. So, despite the wealth of material from Egypt, we need to recognize that the pharaohs were also masters of misinformation. Many of the sites that have um, religious uh, connotation or parts of the Christian religion, so to speak, have been destroyed by ISIS. I've seen it on the, on the internet, but I thought I would add this to let you see how hard they're working to try to destroy that credibility or the existence of Christians in that part of the world. This is part of an article I found and it's worth reading. The Islamic State has destroyed one of the oldest Christian sites in Iraq as part of its campaign against ancient sites in the country, according to satellite photographs published by the Social Press on Wednesday and confirmed by Iraqi officials and historians. The monastery at St. Elijah uh, was destroyed. 
it was just absolutely destroyed and it was raised to the ground it was just completely destroyed and this is so sad and the last paragraph said this gentleman who is a christian member of parliament and he goes on to state the islamic state's goal of destroying iraq's christian identity calling the site one of the most historical in the country he goes on to mention the fact of the great loss and there's no value that can be put on it and he mentioned some other sites that have been destroyed by ISIS. And there are Nineveh, Nimrud, and the tomb of Jonah in Iraq. You know, Palama in Syria. So this is something that's happening. This is something that's happening. So for them to not be able to find any archaeological evidence to match a pharaoh with Moses is not surprising. Given the climate over there in Egypt, and they have been ruled by many uh, foreigners since the time of Persia, that tells you. And then the fact that many of those who wrote those lists had another agenda. As we've seen from our journey, sin for a season. This is something Moses really left us great wisdom on. That we can be mindful of the transitions of life. That we don't always start out right. Because Moses didn't leave voluntarily. He left because he was running for his life. But what he learned over time about fun and what we think God don't understand left great wisdom. He went on to leave such a legacy that none of the pharaohs that had gone before have touched the world in such a way. Payday always comes. Devil going to show up and tell you, you need to pay. And you're going to say, well, you told me I didn't have to. And he's going to tell you, well, you know, I lied because that's what I do. That's who he is. But Moses understood and put his trust in God. He learned a valuable lesson, even though he left in a way I'm sure he thought was his purpose was defeated. He watched those sheep for 40 years and when the Lord called on him he still was trying not to go back so I think we can learn too he ended up in the hall of fame in the roll call of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 with lessons for us all to learn the power that he left we should never forget all that he went through is a testimony for us to understand our season is so important and the main thing for this video is for you to understand because there is no written record that shows what Pharaoh was on the throne during the time of Moses we should not be discouraged that's irrelevant to our faith God leaves us ample information always remember those who bring these things are trying to dissuade you they do not believe in the Bible they are skeptics and critics seeking to dissuade you to not believe in the king of heaven and he who gave his life for you so when these things come you should be like me just walk away miss me because that's the reality of it you cannot convince these people you cannot show them they think you're a fool because you believe just leave that with the people who want to believe that but don't let it shake your faith in the word of the living God.